Okay, everyone. So we're going to be reviewing the challenge problems from Wednesday, November 11th session um, in this video, right? So that was a Wednesday session right before an exam. So there's no time, there's no other session to go over the challenge problems given that night. And so this additional video is to help you um, kind of review those problems and prepare for the exam. Okay, so tonight's problems, there were seven. Um, there were two gas law problems. There were five thermo problems. Um, that wasn't supposed to be representative of your exam. I just wanted to make long answer questions um, that are exam difficulty uh, regarding the topics. I just happened to come up with um, more thermo questions. Okay, so this the first two are going to be our gas law questions. So here you're told that you have a piston with carbon dioxide gas in it, okay? And that this has a, um, a valve that um, allows carbon dioxide to escape in a controllable manner into a reaction chamber where it can react with hydrogen gas, okay? So that's where this reaction is going to occur. An experiment you run where 11.4 grams of water vapor are produced, which would be gaseous water, um, okay, and in this experiment, hydrogen is the limiting reactant or reagent, and carbon dioxide is allowed to flow to react stoichiometrically with the hydrogen. All excess carbon dioxide remains in the piston. Okay, so what they're saying is that you formed 11.4 grams of water, hydrogen was our limiting reactant, and only enough CO2 to completely react with that hydrogen was released from the piston. Okay, so any CO2 gas not used in the reaction will still remain in the piston. And they ask, what is the volume of the piston at the end? Okay, so you have P1, V1, T1, and N1. And I try to label that. Um, and then also P2, T2, V2, and N2. Okay, and so we weren't told anything about our pressures or our temperatures, whether at the beginning or at the end. And so I wrote a question mark next to all of those. Okay, but I was told my initial volume of my piston was 2.85 liters and my initial number of moles was 1.33. Okay, now my volume two is unknown, but I underlined it because that's um, what we want to solve. And then my N2, I wrote X, right? We don't have that value, but it will represent the number of excess moles um, remaining after the reaction took place, right? How many moles of CO2 is remaining in that piston? And so to find how many moles are remaining, we're first going to find how many moles we used, okay? And so we always find how much we used by starting with how much product we could have made based on our limiting reactant. Okay, so we had 11.40 grams of water that we could have produced. Um, and so we're going to convert that to moles using its molar mass. Okay, and then from there we can use our balanced chemical equations to convert from moles of water to moles of carbon dioxide. And when we do this math out, we find that 0 0.316 moles of carbon dioxide gas were used up. Okay, but we don't, again, care how much was used. We care about how much we have remaining. And so the moles of CO2 gas remaining is how much we started with, 1.33, minus how much we used. And so we find that we had 1.014 moles of CO2 gas, um, again, at the end. That is our N2 number. And so this is one of our change problems. Right, and so we're going to use our generic expression and cross out anything that doesn't change or we're not told information about. Right, so we don't really know anything about pressure or temperature, so I cross those out. And my simplified expression is V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. And so from here, all I do is I plug in my numbers. Right, so we knew V1, we knew N1, and we now know N2. And so when we solve for V2, our final volume, it becomes 2.17 liters. Okay, so this is our second problem. It is um, kind of a little unique spin on a gas over water problem, right? And so it's um, the above equation shows the decomposition of sodium sulfate 
when heated in a test tube. And so the oxygen produced was collected by the displacement of water at 45 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it says oxygen produced, which is a gas, was collected by the displacement of water. So that's indicating, indicating to me that this is a collecting over water problem. Okay, and so we're told that we run this experiment and find that the total pressure is 1.44 atmospheres. Okay, the volume of the gas is found to be 0.6 liters. And we're told that the vapor pressure at our temperature of 45 degrees Celsius is 71.9 torr. Okay, then they said, if you originally start with 2.25 grams of sodium sulfate, what is the percent yield for this reaction? Okay, and so again, this is kind of a, a derivative question. It's not your straight up textbook type of collecting gas over water question. Um, but it's a little bit more unique, but kind of the beginning is your classic approach to one of these problems, right? So you have a total pressure, which we're given to be 1.44 atmospheres, and that's gonna equal the pressure of our oxygen gas, right? Plus the pressure of our uh, water, which this water is contamination, right? We don't want that there. Now we're told that the pressure of the water is 71.9 torr, which we can use a conversion factor to um, convert to atmospheres. And so what we find is that the pressure of water in terms of atmospheres is 0 0.0946. Okay, and so what we do is we plug that in for the pressure of our water, and we can find that the pressure of our oxygen gas in terms of atmospheres is 1.345. Okay, and so now we successfully have gotten the pressure of just our oxygen gas. Okay, but we can't do a lot with just pressure. Right, whenever we're going from one species to another, we use moles. And so I'm gonna solve for how many moles of oxygen gas do we, do we have? And so I kind of changed around my ideal gas law and I get that N equals PV over RT. And I plug in the partial pressure of my oxygen, 1.345, my volume of gas, which was given in the prompt, my ideal gas law constant, which is a constant, and then my temperature in Kelvin, which is, 318 because it's 273 plus my temperature of 45 degrees Celsius. And what I find is we would have 0 0.0309 moles of oxygen gas, okay, that we collected, right? We physically are measuring this after the experiment occurred. But we're getting asked for percent yield, right? And all of this that we did above was experimental data that we collected, right? We would have measured the total pressure. We would have um, and then solve for um, oxygen based on that. But up here, this is all experimental data, okay? And so to find percent yield, we don't just need experimental data, but we also need to find our theoretical data, which we can find based on our starting amount, 2.25 grams of sodium sulfate, okay? And so we can use the molar mass to convert to moles of sodium sulfate, and then we can use our balanced chemical equation to find out that we should have been able to produce 0 0.0317 moles, theoretically, based on how much starting reactant we had. And so what's our percent yield? Our percent yield is the number of moles of oxygen gas that we collected experimentally, 0 0.0309, divided by how many we should have gotten um, theoretically, 0 0.0317. Okay, and when we do this, we would have found that our percent yield is about 97.5%. Okay, now some of you may have wondered why I didn't just keep um, going from here, my moles of oxygen gas, why didn't I keep going to find how many grams of sodium sulfate that would have been? And the next slide kind of shows this problem as a spectrum, right? Um, which we've also done a reverse problem before in which we're going kind of from right to left. But this up here kind of shows how you approach this problem in the typical manner, right? How you typically are asked. Typically you have to go from total pressure and go this way to find either moles of reactant or grams of reactant. Okay, but here we're asked to find percent yield, in which case we're gonna take our total pressure information to find experimental information, and we're gonna find the starting grams of starting reactant to find information regarding our theoretical yield. Okay, and you might notice four little arrows that point upwards. Okay, and where these two lines intersect could have been at any of these four spots to calculate our percent yield. 
right? So based on the 2.25 grams of starting amount, um, we could have found how many moles of starting amount we had. We could have found number of moles of oxygen gas we should have had, or we could have found the pressure of oxygen gas we should have had, okay? And so at any of these four points, whether we used pressure of oxygen, moles of oxygen, moles of reactant, or grams of reactant, we could have done experimental divided by theoretical, and you would have gotten that 97.5% either way. I personally decided to do the calculation at the number of moles of oxygen. But again, you could have done it at any of these four points that the arrows point to. Okay, moving on to um, thermo. Um, this is a classic enthalpy of formation question. Okay, so you're given an equation, which hopefully you noticed is not balanced. Okay, and you're given a chart of information to find your overall delta H value, and you're asked um, what the enthalpy change is for three moles of hydrocarbon. Okay, so this is the way I did it. There's going to be another way that I'll describe at the very end that you could have done it. Okay, but what I did is I balanced my chemical equation. So um, I started with one mole of this hydrocarbon, and then from there I just filled in um, my coefficients. Okay, and so this is how it is balanced, and I wrote the enthalpy value of formation values for all of these compounds from the table directly below. Notice oxygen gas, which is in its natural state, has an enthalpy of formation value equal to zero. Okay, and so we find the change in enthalpy for a reaction by adding together the enthalpy of all of our products and subtracting from it the enthalpy of all of our reactants. Okay, and what's important is that the enthalpy values given in the table are in kilojoules per mole meaning you have to multiply it by the coefficients in the balanced chemical equations. Okay, so starting with our products, we have six molecules of water, each with an enthalpy of formation of negative 285.8, and we have five molecules of CO2, each with an enthalpy of formation of negative 393.5. We're gonna add all of that together, and then we're gonna subtract, and it's really important that you distribute this negative sign if there's many reactants, but from this, we're gonna subtract all of our reactants multiple, uh, added together, right? So there's one mole of the hydrocarbon, which is negative 173 in terms of enthalpy of formation, plus, and it should have been eight times zero because there's eight molecules of oxygen, but eight times zero is just zero, okay? When you do this math, you'd find that the delta H for this equation is negative 3,509.2 kilojoules. But realize, that this is per one mole of our hydrocarbon, C5H12. And I underline the one like this because the number here would just be the coefficient in front of C5H12. Okay, and so because the coefficient's one, this delta H value is per one mole of C5H12. But the question asked, how much energy is evolved with three moles of the hydrocarbon? And so I say three moles of my hydrocarbon times one mole releases um, 3,509 kilojoules, and this would give me that um, three moles would release 10,528 kilojoules, okay? The other way you could have done this problem is because they're asking for it in terms of three moles of C5H12, you could have balanced this equation by starting out with a three in front of the hydrocarbon and then balancing it from there. Um, when you got to your final answer, it, it should have um, um, come out the same. Okay. Okay, moving on to the next question. So I'll give you um, a minute to read this. So this is going to be a phase change um, problem. It's actually very similar to one given before where we're doing benzene and we're going to go from 105 degrees Celsius down to 100, negative 110. Oh, I'm so sorry. That says cools to 110 degrees Celsius. That is supposed to say negative 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, so please do not do 110 degrees Celsius. It is supposed to say negative 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, and I, I will um, post that on your page. Um, 
Okay, and so let's look at this problem. And I always, and all the information you need is given here. Okay, and so I always draw a diagram um, like this to help me kind of organize the information um, in front of me, right? So I start at a temperature of 105 degrees Celsius and benzene at that point is going to be gas. Okay, and so when it's in the freezer, it's gonna cool down and cool down and cool down until I get to 80 degrees Celsius, which is my boiling point, right? Boiling and condensation point. So at this point, my temperature is gonna stop changing and all my gas molecules are gonna become liquid, right? So they're gonna be losing that energy um, through condensation. And then once all of my particles are in the liquid form, right? I'm going to start cooling back down. I'm gonna plummet in temperature down until six degrees Celsius, which is my um, freezing and melting points, right? Which is where fusion occurs. Um, and at that point, again, my temperature is not gonna change, okay? Until all of my liquid molecules become solid. And then once it's all solid, again, I will start cooling down until again, negative 10 degrees Celsius. I did not mean for it to be 100, negative 110, okay? And then you might notice I did a little conversion up here. They told me I have 1.2 moles of benzene, which I used the molar mass to find is also 93.73 grams, okay? And so to find the total amount of heat evolved in this problem, I actually break it up into five separate steps, right? So each one of my steps is labeled. And so my first step is going to be Q or my heat that I release as a gas, right? Because up here it's a gas. Okay, and so Q equals MC delta T. And so my mass is 93.73 grams. My specific heat capacity, I have to make sure to use the value for when it's a gas, so 1.05. My change in temperature, my final temperature is 80 degrees Celsius, my initial 105. So when I plug in these values, I get my heat of my gas is negative 2,460 joules. Okay. Now my next step is to look at my phase transition from a gas to a liquid, right? Which is kind of that vaporization step. So my enthalpy of vaporization was given as 30.5 kilojoules per mole. Okay, and we have 1.3 moles of benzene. This tells me that this involves 36.6 kilojoules of energy. But realize vaporization is the process of going from a liquid to a gas. But in this case, and I can see this from my graph, I'm going from a gas to a liquid, which is the reverse reaction, which means if I'm reversing the reaction, I have to change the sign. Okay, so the, the energy or the heat involved in step two would actually be negative 36.6 kilojoules, not positive. Okay, moving on to step three. So step three is gonna be just like step one, except we're involving the liquid form of benzene, right? So we still have 93.73 grams, the specific heat for the liquid form is 1.7 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then my temperature change as I'm a liquid goes from um, the initial value of 80, which goes second, and my final value in temperature of six, right? So my delta T should be six minus 80. When I solve for that heat, it comes out to negative 11,791 joules, okay? So now we just need to find the heat involved in steps four and five. Okay, so step four is our fusion step. So the enthalpy change of fusion is 10 kilojoules per mole. Again, we have 1.2 moles, which is 12 kilojoules. But again, fusion is in reference from going from a solid to a liquid. But here we're going from a liquid to a solid. So in essence, it's the reverse reaction. And so this step would not involve positive 12 kilojoules, but rather it would involve negative 12 kilojoules of energy. Okay, lastly, step five, the heat of solid, um, right? And so the mass in the solid form is 93.73 grams. The specific heat of the solid form is 1.51 joules per gram degree Celsius. And the temperature change was supposed to be negative 10 minus zero, giving us a heat um, of negative 1,415. And so how much total energy was evolved. Well, you just add all those numbers up. One thing I would note is that you have to convert them all to the same units. So for example, in step four, it was negative 12 kilojoules. I converted that to 12, negative 12,000 joules. Okay, added them all up. My total heat that evolved was negative 
meaning it was flowing out, it was released, and 64,266 joules. Okay. This next problem is a classic heat exchange problem. Um, they are just asking you what the equilibrium temperature is, okay? So this one's just a little bit different algebraically, um, but the actual setup itself is rather similar, okay? And so the important part about a problem like this is realizing you have two different things going on, right? You have heat that is gained, okay? And that's gonna be equal to the negative heat that you lost. Okay, and so in the problem, when you read it, you'll see that the temperature of water increased, meaning that's going to be represented by Q gained. And the temperature of your copper decreased, meaning the copper represents your heat that's lost. Okay, and the Q of each of these respectively is equal to MC delta T. Okay, so basically I rewrote this equation as the mass of my water times the specific heat of my water times the change in temperature of my water equals negative mass of my copper times specific heat of my copper times change in heat of my copper. Okay, and so what I do from here is I plug in all my values. Okay, so all the values I know are plugged in. As you'll see, I even plugged in my initial temperatures, but my final temperature I left as TF, and we're gonna have to solve for that. Okay, and as you can see, this is actually pretty um, rather algebraically taxing compared to what we normally do. Right, so you have to distribute these numbers and you have to isolate TF onto one side. But when you eventually solve for TF here, again, it's all just algebra, you'd find that your final temperature is 21.2 degrees Celsius, right? And that makes sense, right? If you plug that in and look at it in relation to water and copper, copper went from 110 down to 21.2 degrees Celsius, right? So it decreased in temperature while the water went from 20 degrees Celsius up to 21.2 degrees Celsius, right? So the water actually increased in temperature. And so this relatively makes sense. Okay, um, the next problem again is a, it's a calorimeter question, a bomb calorimeter question. Um, and you have a reaction that is run and absorbs 1.8 kilojoules of energy. Okay, and if the, uh, you're told the calorimeter contains 75 milliliters, uh, which is just 75 grams of water. You're told the heat capacity and they wanna know what's your change in temperature. Okay, and so the heat of my reaction, it said it absorbs um, 1.8 kilojoules, which means it absorbs or positive 1,800 joules, right? That's the Q of my reaction, okay? Now the Q of my surroundings, which is my water, has to be equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction um, compared to my Q of my reaction meaning the Q of my surroundings has to be not positive 1800, but rather negative 1800 joules of energy, which would be equal to the mass of my water, 75 grams times the specific heat of my water, or 0.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, times my change in temperature, which we're solving for, plus the specific, uh, sorry, not the specific, just the heat capacity of my calorimeter, which was given as 48, times my change in temperature. Okay, and you basically combine these terms together and you get that negative 1800 is equal to 361.8 times our change in temperature. And when you solve for that change in temperature, it comes out to just below um, five degrees Celsius. And again, that negative is just saying that the temperature decreased um, or the water of the temper, uh, sorry, the temperature of the water decreased by how much? About five degrees Celsius during this reaction. Okay, this is the last challenge problem to go over and it's kind of just a straightforward Hess's law question. And so we have a kind of what I call a goal reaction up here and what I refer to as sub reactions down here. Okay, and so these together are a multi-stepped um, method to undergo this reaction. Okay, so we basically wanna add these up in a way that gives us this more simplified version of this multi-stepped reaction. Okay, and so what I do or tell students to do here is I always write my goal reaction at the top and I write my three, in this case, three goal, not goal, sorry, um, my three sub reactions. So they're labeled. The first one I label as one, two, and then three respectively. And so what I try to do and what I suggest all students do is 
you try to find a chemical species that is unique to each sub reaction, right? So OF2 gas is found in our gold reaction and it is only found in our um, first sub reaction. SF4 is in the gold reaction. It is only in this second sub reaction. Sulfur solid in our gold reaction and only in this third um, sub reaction. Okay, and so once you identify these unique species, you look and you say, to get to the goal reaction, what manipulation do I have to make? Right, so OF2 in the goal reaction and my um, first sub reaction is a reactant. Okay, so I don't have to flip my reaction, but my coefficient of my goal reaction is two. And so that tells me that I have to take my first sub reaction and manipulate it by multiplying the whole thing, including my delta H. By two. Okay, and so that's what I do. I rewrite it, and you can see my delta H reflects that. Next, for subreaction two, I look at SF4 um, gas, which appears in the goal reaction. They both have a coefficient of one, so I don't have to multiply it by anything, but it appears as a product in the goal reaction. Well, in my subreaction two, it's a reactant. So that tells me I have to flip this second reaction. So that's what I do. I rewrite it, flipping it, and you can see. I reflect that on my delta H by changing the sign. Lastly, again, sulfur solid in the goal reaction and my third sub reaction. And in order for them to match, I would need a coefficient of two in front of in this third sub reaction. So I'll multiply the whole thing, including the delta H by two, and that gives me my manipulated equation. Okay, from here, I wrote in my manipulated sections, I took my the ones that I had already manipulated and I put all the reactants together and said they're, they're going to all the products. And when you cancel things out or reduce their coefficients appropriately, this is what you get at the end. And as you can see, this is the goal reaction given to us, okay? And so once you do that and confirm that you correctly manipulated the equations to get the goal reaction, you find your delta H, by adding up all the delta H's of your manipulated equations. Okay, so I pointed an arrow to the three numbers I used because these were the delta H's after I manipulated the respective equations. And my total delta H for this problem would equal negative 319.5 kilojoules. Okay, if you're ever trying one of these problems and you cannot find a chemical species in a sub-equation that is unique to that equation, what I'd say, is um, identify something that's unique to as many uh, sub equations as you can and manipulate those accordingly. And then try to find a chemical species that actually doesn't appear in your goal reaction, that appears in that last sub reaction that you couldn't just easily manipulate. And your goal when manipulating that last reaction should be to maybe cancel out something, right? So if you have hydrogen gas on the reactant side and it doesn't appear in your goal reaction, you have to see where else it appears in your other sub reactions so that they cancel out and don't appear in your goal reaction. Okay, that being said, that is all I have for tonight. Um, and so I wish you all the best of luck studying for your upcoming exam on Friday. Um, and then I hope you guys all have a very enjoyable weekend um, after. Okay, so best of luck studying.